Hello and welcome to TND World Power Up Wildfire and Risk Mitigation. We're so thrilled you're here with us today and we can't wait to get started with this session. Wildfire Mitigation Using Satellite Analytics, Leading IOU Real World Implementation. Uh, we're grateful you're here and we want to first thank our sponsor AI Dash. This session is brought to you by AI Dash and we're grateful to have you as a partner as part of this very important series on wildfire and risk mitigation. So thank you for, for being with us and partnering with us for this event. I do want to talk to the audience about how to engage today. Uh, it's very important. We want to, we're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end, and, and we want you to be engaged and, and part of the, the event, the presentation today. So first, chat. Um, you, there's three boxes at the bottom of your screen. You can see chat. You can chat with the audience, uh, with the panelists. Feel free to use that chat. Um, to, to put out any conversation with the audience and have discussion um, amongst yourselves with that. We also will share important information like our speakers' bios and other uh, content from AI Dash uh, within that chat today. Um, you can raise your hand. So if you need support from one of our TND World team, uh, feel free to raise your hand and one of our TND World staff will reach out to you for any technical support that you may need during the session today. Um, and then we are, as I mentioned, going to have time for questions. We encourage you to use that Q&A window for all of your questions. If you submit those there, we are going to try to get to as many questions at the end of this presentation as possible, and that will help us keep it organized and make sure we answer everybody's questions. Um, so again, you know, throughout the session today, there's no harm in putting those questions in. And as we get, when we get to the end, we are saving time at the end to answer as many of those as possible. Um, so with that, I want to make a few introductions. Uh, with us today, we've got Bradley Smith. He's the Senior Director of Operations and Sales at AI Dash. And also with him, he's got, we've got Dave James. He's a wild, Wildfire Resiliency Plan Manager at Avista. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Bradley to get us started. Thanks, Gina. Awesome. So today we're going to be really talking about wildfire risk mitigation to electric utilities using satellite analytics and also talking about a business journey using this type of technology too. And so today, hold on, let me make sure that we're, yep, cool. Um, this is kind of the agenda where we're gonna be talking about today. It's like the traditional approaches to vegetation management, wildfire risk mitigation for electric utilities, the escalating nature of this risk as well. I mean, there are a lot of macroeconomic headwinds that you guys are facing. So it's becoming an increasingly difficult task to do this. Risk is also increasing, so we'll be touching upon that. Then we'll be talking about the emerging technologies that you're able to do to get better situational awareness, um, kind of get a holistic knowledge of what's going on in your network and take a risk-based approach to vegetation-related wildfire um, within your, your network. And then we'll show you some of that technology in action and then also speak about a business journey. So wildfires and electric utilities. I mean, this has been kind of a growing issue recently. Um, before, it wasn't really even considered like a really uh, a risk management type of aspect. This was really contained into like a weather event, really. There weren't really formalized plans that existed back then because the risk wasn't that great. Um, there was just kind of that regular cyclical nature of vegetation management as well. Um, there wasn't really that holistic knowledge of what's going on in your system too. The surveying was only being done on a certain percentage of your network. So you didn't have like, you know, you had a lot of blind spots, more blind spots than you did kind of in the foreground. So that was one of the things you didn't really rely on a lot of technology as well. I mean, there wasn't the technology back there to really support this too. There's been a lot of advancements, but there still has been like not really a technology or data driven approach to be able to tackle this as well as limited risk, uh, risk mapping as well. And to kind of highlight that too, um, Bill Johnson was a former CEO of PG&E. I was quoted saying that in late 2017, a lot of people didn't really view this as a risk in Northern California. But I mean, you know, history is also like the trajectory it is increasing. So the, the dangers are, are there. Um, no one really looked at it as enterprise level risk. Um, and 2007, there wasn't really a lot of regulations even involved in this. And PSPs were, were kind of very sparse until 2018 and they really got um, going. Um, and, and you can see the risk escalating too, even in the financial realm too. The S&P Global Ratings downgraded a lot of the investor and utilities in California due to the unprecedented wildfire risk and the you know, historic droughts too. And then like fast forward from that, you know, in late 2017, no one really thought of this as a risk. And then now in, in 2021 20, uh, and 2022, PG&E is going to spend about $13 billion according to their wildfire risk mitigation plan. Um, Dave, was there anything you wanted to add about that kind of traditional approach in this escalating risk too? First, I have to find that unmute button. Thank you, Bradley. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I think, you know, uh, Western Utilities, if you're, if you're not, if you don't have a plan or you're not in the middle of building one, 
then you're, you're, you're contemplating it. <laughs> and so I think this has really captured the, you know, the attention of not only people that are, you know, insiders, but also uh, our first responders, the public community and elected officials. So it is a, the top priority enterprise risk for, for most of us. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, and, I mean, you can just see too, like some of the trajectory too. There's a lot of stats. And, and I mean, just anecdotally, the name fires. I mean, we're going to be running out of names here in a while and start making up like alphanumeric names for like all the weather events that are happening and how they did like hurricanes in 2020. But it is really, I mean, these are just some of the, the recent name fires that have happened too. And then you can also see the graphs too and the trend lines that are happening too. So you can see on the on the left-hand side of the screen, like the regionality-based increases in large-scale wildfires and the increase. And all but three different regions on the West Coast of the, of the U.S. Are, are seeing dramatic increases, like statistically significant increases. And then when you look at like the really, really big fires, like the billion dollar fires, there have been $18 billion fires since uh, 1991. And if you look at the trend line, too, on like fire um, impact and fire death financially and death, it's almost correlated evenly, too. I mean, they are becoming increasingly. And when you think about impact, too, it's, this is becoming a, a big issue. Um, Dave, is there anything you wanted to talk about uh, about this too? I mean, I know that like the, there's kind of a lot of macroeconomics and like the drought conditions too, and then the West Coast are really impacting everyone. You know, the only thing I would say here is that and there's always this tendency to look at fire history and just sort of project it forward and say oh, it's, it's linear, you know, we know it's increasing, it's linear. It's probably going to be a lot worse than linear. Uh, you know, look, look at the billion dollar wildfires in the last few years. I mean, it is exploding and, uh, the outlook for this season, it's pretty dismal. So I think we're going to have a, a real active year unless Mother Nature comes in and stomps some of them out. And hopefully it does. I mean, like we, I mean, we can only hope. I know that there's been like you know, really, you know, historic or like worldwide too, like rain deficit, rainfall deficits have happened. And hopefully we can make up some of that because it is really getting like you know worse and worse. It seems like every year. And, you know, one of the things that we can say is like risk is getting worse. I mean, just knowing that risk gets worse. All right. That's nice. But like, you know, as Warren Buffett said, too, I love this quote. I'm predicting the rain doesn't count. I mean, building the arc does. So, you know, if you know that risk is increasing, what can we do to mitigate risk? And you can never get risk down to zero. I mean, that's going to be impossible. But you can do a lot of things to be able to gain situational awareness and be able to act when you do notice something is wrong. And when you think about risk, too, as Dave, I stole this from Dave's uh, webinar they had at TND uh, uh, World just a couple of weeks ago, too. So if you guys uh, would love to go see it back, it's really informative. Um, but basically, risk is, uh, is probability times impact. There's a lot of things that are happening in the world that are increasing the probability for an ignition. Um, you know, climate change, what we're mentioning, the droughts. I mean, if you look at the drought map from the same day in 2010 and 2021, I mean, this is scary. I mean, that is insane. I mean, it looks like... This is a heat map for like a nuclear holocaust. I mean, it's just really intense red. I mean, like that is just striking. And then when you think about forest management practices too, there's an, a, a more, more fuel density than there ever has before. And then this drought has just sucked all the moisture out of it. I mean, it's basically tender too. And then when you think about the migratory patterns and kind of like how humans are, are shifting, especially post COVID to more rural environments, like moving out of those urban environments into, into wooey zones and stuff, the rise in population there is increasing the threat vectors. There's gonna be more structures susceptible for fire risk than there were before because of those habits too. And then that also is increasing the expansion of utility infrastructure into those areas. So if you're not driving, you're not gonna get in a car accident. If your infrastructure isn't in these high fire threat zones, you're going to be de-risking, but your risk has to increase to be able to serve those emerging communities too. Um, and then there's also like things like the invasive bark beetle species, which is creating more dead trees, more tender, um, and the intensifying vegetation management problems. I mean, our arborists are causing more now than they ever had before too. Um, it is becoming an increasing problem. And the bark beetle situation, um, just in an eight-year period, PG&E in their territory alone, um, according to their 2020 uh, wildfire risk mitigation plan, had 147 million trees die from that base of species. It's, I mean, it's an increasing problem for sure. Um, Dave, was there anything you wanted to add to about these kind of macro challenges that are, that are increasing? I know that West Coast is really crazy, but anything, anything you want to add that I didn't cover? Well, I think it's important to recognize that some of these are really outside the utilities control, right? So we, we can do a lot of things, but it may not be possible to actually reduce the overall risk because of these macro trends. So um yeah we're we're definitely this is a, this is a tough business 
It is. I mean, you know, it's like these headwinds that are, that are facing you. It's um, even doing everything right is going to be challenging to be able to get this like you know better. And then according to the CU, uh, CUPC, you know, power line fires are ten times on average ten times larger than other fires. So when you think about the impact too, I mean, we measure impact and you know humans like human lives, uh, you know, lives lost, buildings burned, acres burned, um, financial loss. And so when you think about these macro challenges of increasing probability, a lot of these are paired with the population increases in these wildfire zones, um, the increased infrastructure, the increases in suppression costs. It's um, becoming really challenging, especially when you think about, you know, structures in Wui, way more susceptible for wildfire. They are growing at a rapid rate uh, at about 2 million acres per year. There's already 46 million residencies and 70,000 communities. And when you do the math too, 46 million residencies and the average residency is 2.83 people. That's about 36% of the America is in movie zones right now. And then I mean, it's just really a startling st statistic too. It's really increasing at, at a heavy rate too. And you can see the WUI map on what exists now and what's expanding. There's a lot of room for expansion. And when you think about these macroeconomic trends of people leaving dense urban environments and moving kind of to rural zones, it is, you know, it's just increasing the threat too. Combining that too with, we're, we're, I mean, human population is growing a lot. 100 million people in the next 80 years is going to be in the US alone too. So if you think about the representative sample, if it's going to be going kind of evenly out dispersed throughout those different types of zones, there's going to be about 30 more million people that could be potentially impacted because they're in those high fire threat zones and those wooey zones. And then like, you know, the snowball effect of like, you know, these fire suppression methodologies too, they're causing, you know, sm like, you know, fewer small fires and larger big fires. Um, that's also one of those things going to impact more people. Um, and, and I mean, wildfire suppression costs are increasing at a dramatic rate too. Even when you think about inflation, it's still about 4X what it was a couple decades ago. And you can see kind of the trend lines too on fire deaths and fire dollars lost. And that's just the 2019 too. And if we think about 2020, that was a pretty bad year. So, I mean, these trends are still increasing pretty steadily. Was there anything that uh, you wanted to add to that, Dave, too? No, nothing here. I mean, I, I think, you know, you're really doing a great job of just reinforcing the message on why we're doing this, so why this is important. Well, a lot of it, too, is like we can never get risk to zero, but like we can de-risk a lot of different areas in this, too. And like one of the big, you know, things that the low hanging fruit opportunities to de-risk, especially in wildfire, is just gaining that better situational awareness. If one tree can cause a fire that's a billion dollars, potentially, like identify those potential trees that are going to be there and more surgically remove them. And it's not like this is something that, you know, everyone doesn't know already. Like the more you know, the more you can act and like having data driven decisions is more optimal than just using kind of a cyclical program to treat, you know, lines pretty much. Um, but it wasn't really possible until like the advancement in technology and where it is now. I mean, when you think about like the traditional methods of just, you know, driving lines or, or doing aerial, it's just impossible to do it on distribution. I mean, on transmission, like you're going to have to figure it out because of the regulations. Oh, distribution is unbelievably challenging. I mean, there's about 8 million overhead distribution power lines, uh, miles of, of distribution power lines in America too. So it's just an incredibly challenging you know, task too. So when we think about like ways to be able to get that holistic knowledge of what's going on in your system, you know, satellites is kind of like the only way to potentially do this. And, and I'll explain some of these reasons now, but satellites innovation curve is not what you see on Google maps anymore too. It is really going up incredibly. The Google map imagery that we're seeing is typically like 2012, that type of stuff. I mean, just in the past couple of years alone, there have been thousands of satellites that have gone to orbit and every single satellite that's going up is better than the one previous. Like we can't repair a satellite. We can't add a new feature to a satellite once it's in orbit. It's just up there. So the innovation curve is really going up and you constantly read about Elon Musk. I'm um, just sending up constellation after constellation. It's becoming really um, pervasive and incredible. But we're able to measure a lot of different things with a high level of accuracy across the entire network. So you can identify blind spots. Um, and let me just kind of show you like some of the reasons why we couldn't do this before. And I think this is a really cool slide that shows some of the differences between where we were with satellites, because we basically have an archival historic satellite database from generations ago. So you can really see the stark difference in, 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 in resolution from each different thing. And even revisit rates are becoming more of us too, by a lot. Um, but what you see now is basically um, the same area of land in 1972, observed by the Landsat 1, and then in 2008, um, observed by the WBO3 constellation. And what you see is 80 meter resolution on the outside in the, in the black and white, and then 30 centimeter resolution overlaid on the middle. 
So you can see it's like pretty cool, but you're like, oh, what, what can you really tell? It looks a little bit more colorful. This is what one pixel from 1970s um, represents now in 30 centimeter resolution. So you can see the driveway, the lush trees around this like, you know, farm. You can see all the surrounding areas with a lot of robust detail. I mean, this is generations of improvement too. And the innovation curve now is going up through the roof just due to advancements in, in technology and then the emergence of the space industry in general. I mean, now we're able to solve a lot of problems from space that you could never do before due to these new advancements. So it's really pretty cool. And some of the things that you can do with um, satellite imagery too, it's you can detect a lot of things that the human eyes can't detect for one. I mean, we well, from humans only have the Roy G. Biv you know, spectrum of light that we can see, like red, blue, green, like that, that combination. We can only see that. But with satellites, we have a lot of different bands of spectrum that we're able to leverage to be able to perceive things that human eyes cannot perceive and perceive them beforehand. So we can perceive with, um, you know, the red edge band of spectrum, which you can see is, you know, adjacent to kind of like the near infrareds and the, and the Roy G. Biv. It's kind of in between those two. Um, we can perceive different like characteristics like chlorophyll count, water density within um, vegetation. So we can differentiate between dry, you know, tender and, and green healthy grass and, and things like that too. So we can identify hazard trees outside the right of way that are unstructurally sound based on these characteristics that we can observe with the red edge band of spectrum. That like, you know, human eyes cannot measure chlorophyll count. I mean, it's just impossible. And then when you think about like historic knowledge too, I mean, we are doing change detection. So when you think about like um, the scan over scan, you see the decline and you track the decline on all the trees along all of your lines. So you kind of have that holistic knowledge of what's going on when. So it's a really, really powerful technique. Um, there's also satellites out there. They're uh, not just multispectral satellites, but like synthetic aperture radar that can uh, penetrate cloud coverage after a weather event. And there's a constellation of synthetic aperture radar satellites that are going up in 2024 that's going to have 10 centimeter resolution at a revisit rate of every, I mean, every couple hours almost to like all the major areas on earth. So after a large scale weather event, you'd be able to task it, go over there and actually do that change detection too. So it's a really powerful technology. And, it, and again, it's just, just going up through the roof all the time. And there's a lot of different techniques too that we can do. And Dave, I would love for you to add, add into this because I know you've, you've um, used some of these techniques in the past and, and this, these different types of technologies. And there's a lot of you know, things that, just satellites are, are the, uh, uniquely at a position to be able to do, like identifying those hazard trees. And then when you think about like, you know, predicting the future and forecasting the future, it's a lot easier when you measure the past. So you can pull that past archival historic data and do a pixel to pixel comparison year over year. So you understand those growth rates. So you're not applying treatment to areas that aren't really of a concern. You know exactly when you should apply them optimally. So you can also treat more miles kind of shift from a reactionary program there this higher cost. Like once a line is already done, like that's going to cost you a lot more to recover than doing preventative maintenance. So if you can kind of shift that reactionary budget into preventative maintenance, then you're able to apply more treatment to more miles, reducing probability for ignition. And you can do a lot of different things, get that situational awareness and that holistic knowledge and also reduce hot spotting. Hot spotting costs a lot of money. If you can shift those um, different you know, trim programs into a cyclical program too, where you're hitting it at the right moment, you're also able to apply more treatment to more miles, reducing probability for ignition. Um, and some of these you, you just can't do. I mean, it's impossible to fly a drone over the course of, you know, say an 8,000 mile system or something, you know, it's, it's impossible to do it. So there's a lot of pros and cons they're able to do it. And then the cost to value ratio is pretty stark. Um, but Dave, is there anything you wanted to add to that that might, you know, kind of align with uh, a Vista's journey in this as well? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, data up here, but, for electric distribution, for me, this is a game changer. The ability to image our entire system with a pass of a satellite, this just cannot be done with drones or ground base or certainly not with aerial assets. Transmission, you know, you can get on a corridor and you can, you can fly with a helicopter and stay on it and pick up uh, LIDAR. And that's kind of the current state of the art, but no one has really cracked open the distribution nut and we know that's the ignition engine for fires. We, the, the data is very clear. There's a lot more activity on that side. So we're um, very interested in, um, in, in focusing and using this, leveraging this technology to give us that holistic view, view of the system. Thanks, Dave, I appreciate that. 
Yeah, I mean, and, and like the speed of acquisition too is one of those things too. Like when you can just you know tap, you know, boom, like pretty much snap your fingers and satellite imagery is uh, acquired. I mean, with drones, so if you can do ten miles a day and you have eight thousand miles, that's a year. And then doing an analysis and then wrapping it up and then taking action, a lot of things have changed. And you know, with drones, they don't have time machines too, so they can't go back in the past and do historic change detection as well. So there's just a lot of different things that you're not able to do with, with drones and. Just one of the big things, just you're, it's impossible to do a distribution network. And then when you get that, you know, clear understanding of what's going on in your network too, like how do you prioritize it if, if you only have budget to be able to do two circuits in this year? Which circuits are the most important? Which ones are at the highest risk too? I mean, when you think about WUI zones, we also think about impact. Where are your customers located? Where are the, the actual infrastructure? How much infrastructure is there? What would be the potential spread? You can look at from a very multi-dimensional aspect and combine a lot of different data sources, including weather data, and then be able to act on it optimally and, and use data-driven approaches to be able to de-risk as much as humanly possible. Um, because when you have that type of knowledge and you have that understanding of your environment and you combine it with your enterprise level data and weather data, it's really powerful and compounding. Um, and Dave, I know you um, on your, your webinar, you were talking about your Wubi rules and kind of like how you grid out your system and then you, each kind of square has a different level of risk. Um, did you want to talk about kind of like how the environmental aspect and like some, because you were talking about the different data source combination too and how powerful that is. Yeah, I mean, you know, I provided an example a couple of weeks ago about creating a Wubi zone. And uh, th this is really, I think, where the industry is headed. We, we, we have to be able to quantify uh, not only the risk, but the risk benefit and, and the AI dash solution is helping us do that. It's, it's really transitioning, transitioning us from traditional cycle-based methods to a risk-driven approach. So that, that, um, you know, that, that's a huge win for us. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that um, when you can support your decisions with data, it's, it's, your, it's going to be a better result the most of the time. I mean, going in blind to anything and like hoping for the best is really never an optimal solution, especially when you think about risk is probability times impact. We want to be able to try to like reduce the impact and I mean, just let's holistically try to reduce the vegetation related risk on a network. Now, a lot of that is just being able to apply treatment to more miles too. I mean, if you can reduce the amount of trees around your network, I mean, that's a big win right there, just alone. I mean, that, that immediately helps you like de-risk it. I'm um, choosing the right, you know, um, um, circuits every year to do too. That's when I'll apply treatment to the right miles every year as well. Um, if you can just um, think about like having that blind spot analysis too, of understanding, hey, if we, you know, we, we hear all these trees that could potentially cause problems. If we don't do something about it, we know it exists. It allows you to kind of like do things more surgically and strategically. And also when you're pairing that with outside the right-of-way management, a lot of organizations don't even have an outside the right-of-way program at all. It's just if they notice it, they'll do something about it. So be able to shift those your budget a little bit to outside the right-of-way to manage those um, fall-ins too during like a high weather event or high wind event. Um, that, that's going to be also a low-hanging fruit thing to be able to do too. And, and of course, what, what Dave was mentioning too about improved risk mapping and understanding and kind of taking a risk-based approach to vegetation management instead of just a cyclical kind of traditional approach too. Um, was, there, was there anything else that, that you wanted to add to this, Dave? Or? No, you're burning up all my talking points when we get to my slide. <laughs> Well, I'll stop talking so much too. Um, and when you think about it too, it's like we can help reduce acreage burns too. When you're thinking about all this type of stuff, like, you know, in, in the intelligent vegetation management system and satellites analytics, you're able to do a volumetric analysis and kind of define like, well, how many trees are in this area? Like relative to all the other, uh, all the other areas too. When you combine that with moisture information, you kind of understand what the fuel load is a little bit and what that potential impact could be and where your customers are. It, it really makes a, a kind of a, a good difference. Um, and then also when we're thinking about costs are increasing too. So this is just one of those macroeconomic things. I mean, if you can prevent an ignition, then you can prevent a lot of financial impact, buildings destroyed, humans impacted. I mean, be able to reduce acres burn, you're going to be able to save a lot of things, understand where it's contained, where you need to focus your efforts. But if you can just you know, prevent some ignitions, it's really going to have to be a high yielding, low hanging fruit thing to do. And then you can also like kind of like risk mapping and kind of give you yourself a heat map too, to define like what areas are of increased risk and apply more treatment to them. Kind of overlay your grid on top of it and then make the best data driven decisions possible based on what you know. So it's um, the combination of data is, is really powerful, but this is like kind of what a, a little heat map might look like as well. 
And then, so we're going to show you some of the technology in action too. So like some of this, like satellites can do all this. Like you can, like, how can you even tell, like, you know, outside the right away, is that still within the strike zone? Um, it is. We can tell a lot of different things now with satellite analytics. So here's like a, a quick rendering of a 3D imagery um, of, of a grid right now too. So one of the things that satellite analytics can do too is like, you know, how can you even detect it against it? Like we have the ability to correct shape files to overlay this correctly on top of it. You can identify and one of the things with artificial intelligence when you combine that with satellite, with, with satellite imagery, you're able to perceive and detect things that the human eyes couldn't. So we could watch this video, you could drive a million miles and spend hours and years doing that. Um, or you can use artificial intelligence to be able to basically take imagery and differentiate between a shadow and a tree. Um, differentiate between, you can see cliffs and, and the topography using stereo and tri-stereoscope imagery, which is basically one area of focus on but three different angles, two or three different angles, to be able to get that disparity so you can measure trees at unit meter precision. So if you identify with the red edge band of, of, of spectrum, those unstructurally sound trees outside the right of way, but are still tall enough and within the strike zone to be able to fall in, you can surgically pluck them out and be able to reduce your risk of wildfire. And this is a visualization of this. And this is 100% using satellite imagery. So it's pretty futuristic. It's not what you see at, at Google Maps. It's not the old 1970s lands that uh, satellites do. This is like the future. This is, um, it, it really is pretty powerful. So you can see those kind of like pinpoint accuracy. Here we're gonna move to the, oh. all right, cool. And this is some of the workflows. I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit on the video. You can see kind of like how this could be applied to a distribution network. So combining a tremendous amount of different types of satellite imagery, getting your undergrowth, be able to understand exactly where those clearance breaches are going to be. You can bespoke this as well. So if you have a three phase line, you want to have more clearance than a single phase, that you can really look at very multidimensionally and do it on a span level type risk assessment too. So you can see where your customer accounts are the highest, you know, where your risk is the most, and then kind of pair that to be able to reduce probability of, of, of ignition and then also reducing the impact of ignition because it wouldn't be affecting so many humans, so many buildings, so many acres. So you can be really strategic with how you do it. And then kind of shifting your reactionary program into a, like, you know, a, a more preventative maintenance program. So you're able to apply more treatment to more miles and continuously de-risk. Have that positive snowballing effect of when you treat more miles, you prevent more ignitions, you prevent more you know, interruptions. And also when trees are already in lines, it's going to cost you a lot more. So you can kind of see how this workflow um, allows you to be able to increase efficiency for your arborist. So they're not driving so many miles. They're being more, they're treating more miles instead of driving. I'm um, also reducing the, the safety events too, because, you know, same what I was kind of saying, if your electric infrastructure is in a wooey zone, you're increasing your probability of, of ignition. Same way if your drivers are driving a lot, if, you're, if your arborists are driving a lot, it's increasing a risk for a car accident. Um, and this is how easy some of this stuff is to use. So it's really user-friendly technology that helps you really manage this um, aspect of your, of your program really well. Identifying those hazard trees outside the right of way. Um, allowing you to like kind of analyze your effective methods too. Like even if you can shift mechanical to herbicides and TGRs, you're going to be able to apply more treatment to more miles and more advantageously to be able to be more beneficial to you know, that end goal of reducing wildfire risk, conserving more of your budget and you know, keeping reliability, keeping your, your, the power on for your customers as well. And then this slide, uh, Dave, I, I don't want to put any words into your mouth too. So I want you to be able to like speak about your journey. You just want to like, um, maybe explain a little bit about a VISTA, a VISTA's environments, a VISTA's challenges, and then we can like move on to other slides about kind of your different approaches. Sure, thanks Bradley. Yeah, so just a little bit of context, a little bit about our, our, our journey with uh, AI Dash. So uh, VISTA is located in, uh, headquartered in Spokane, Washington, on the, on the east side of Washington State, and we serve primarily Northeastern uh, Washington, down into to the Southeast as well, but we have uh, uh, you know, a lot of customers up in the Northeast. And then into the panhandle of Idaho and down through parts of central Idaho. So we have, you know, just for context, about our approximately 400,000 customers, um, 2,200 miles of transmission circuit, and uh, not, we're just a, a few miles shy of 8,000 on the distribution network. So, you know, that's where we're at and, and who we are. And um, 
In June of 2020, in the middle of COVID, we published our first wildfire resiliency plan. And in our plan is this the concept of doing annual risk tree assessment, danger tree assessment for our distribution. We have never done that. Um, we've always combined the risk tree components with our cycle based trimming and pick them up as we went. So um, we started looking for technology and um, looked at traditional LIDAR, we looked at ground-based LIDAR, but when we were able to connect with AI Dash, it seemed like a, a perfect fit. We conducted a pilot, you know, a, you know, a, kind of a learning session late last year that has gone really well. And now we're essentially just taking the big step and we're going to image our entire system um, starting this year. So, you know, Bradley goes through this really quick, right? I mean, you're looking at those images going, oh, hang on, I can't move that fast, right? There's a lot of information, um, but I, I can break this down. I think, you know, at least for us, we're interested in where are these trees? Where, where do we have uh, emerging encroachments? And moreover, where are the danger trees? Because our stats are very clear. Danger trees are three times more likely to produce uh, an outage than, than encroachment. But of course, we want to keep a, a handle on encroachment as well. And this ability to image our entire system. I mean, think about that. You know everything all at once. That, that is incredibly powerful. Uh, if you can just like kind of take that in, soak that in. You will know everything all at once. And that in vegetation management world, that has not been the case up until I think this technology. And then um, next slide, the uh, integrated vegetation management system. I think you saw flashes of IBMS. The ability to have a single platform, essentially web hosted software. So your data goes on their system because it is a lot of data. Um, your data goes on their system, but it's web hosted, right? It allows us to run reports, uh, forecast our plan, also include our, our budgetary information. So if we get into the situation where we're having to pick, pick and choose based on, on quantifiables, we're gonna choose risk, right? We take the highest risk first. But um, again, I think this is a, a powerful platform it will help us differentiate between our herbicide program and our encroachment program and then the risk tree program. Um, we're, we're still learning. I mean, this is, this is new technology for us, but the team, our team is really ramping up and really starting to embrace this idea um, just beyond what I envision. So, cause we were literally, you know, we're a few, a few months into our journey with AI Dash, but it's been a really, you know, it's really been beneficial thus far and looking forward to expanding that system. So I think I can toss it back to you, Bradley. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I appreciate it. And we're actually at the, the end of our presentation too. So uh, that was a great wrap up too, Dave. So I, I really appreciate that, that perspective too, from hearing about like how you all have been able to leverage it. Um, but yeah, we're excited to hear any of your questions. And also, if anyone wants this slide deck or wants to you know, reach out to discuss anything, my email address is right there. So happy to send it over to anyone. Great. OK, so I do have a couple of questions, but I do want to encourage the audience. Now is the time. If you have not submitted your questions yet, now is the time to do so. Um, so go ahead and put those questions into the Q&A window um, at the bottom of your screen. And as I get started through some of these, we should have time to get to um, quite a few. So we'll do as many as we can. Um, so first one, it says, um, Bradley, it says you mentioned drones can't do everything satellites can. Can you talk a little bit more about that and elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, what, one of the things that, I mean, there's several things that, that drones can do really well, um, but there's several things that drones just impossible to do. And that is like surveying your entire system at once. I mean, it just, the speed of acquisition just takes so long that, you know, as Dave mentioned too, it's like having that holistic knowledge right away is really important um, and, and all at once, because otherwise it's going to take you forever to be able to turn that into actions. 
and like turning raw data and turning into outcomes that are, are better for your for your utility and de-risking it. That's really where the bread meets the butter. Otherwise, it's just you know it's it's fun to use. Other, I mean, it's really not actionable. It's not driving better decision making. So um, that's one of the one of the things. Also, with the red edge band of spectrum, um, we can per we can perceive things that are imperceivable to lidar or human eyes too, like that declining chlorophyll count and water density within vegetation. So we can see that decline scan over scan and identify those trees that are outside the right of way that have the potential to um, actually fall in and cause damage. And as Dave was mentioning, too, danger trees are more of a, uh, an issue than encroachment. So that's one of the big things that, that uh, satellites can do uh, that's differentiated from, from LIDAR. And then the change detection and then that growth rate modeling. Um, LIDAR, is, can, you can't do that historic you know, archival imagery. I mean, satellites have been in orbit since the 70s. Um, LIDAR, you run it once and then you have to use it. Uh, I mean, you're not, there's not some big database of, of LIDAR data that you can leverage to see those historic growth rates and that trending. So it's really inaccurate when you're thinking about that future forecasting of how you can like optimally plan a cycle trim. So uh, those are just some of the, the differences that I would, that I would call out. Dave, I know you've used this a lot too. Like you've used it, used both. Um, is there anything that you want to call out too? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have a lot of, uh, experience with drones you know we've used them i think they're great instruments for like site surveys you want to build a substation or building you know you send a drone up and map the area and it's, you know fantastic that way um but for our system eight thousand miles of distribution and we want you know we want it all right now uh this is this is the technology that will give you that and i think the other thing that's important is that Right now, the technology is 30 centimeters, right? That, that's a foot. And uh, so you're going to get foot pixels, which is not too bad, but it's going to 10 centimeters. That's four inches. <laughs> and it's going to get better than that, right? Uh, it's going to yep. continue to improve. So i um, pretty excited about uh, the ability to leverage this technology. Thanks, awesome. Dave. Yeah. Um, okay, so the I've got another question here. It says, what is the cost of satellites compared to other technologies like drones and aerial survey? I mean, it is significantly less expensive. It really depends on line density too, because you buy satellite imagery in swaths, which are like square kilometers. So it, it depends on like the urban versus rural nature of your environment, but it's significantly um, you know, percentage wise, uh, incredibly cheaper. Dave, did, did you want to maybe, uh, did you have anything that you wanted to talk about on that? Yeah, without, you know, penny down numbers, I will add that when Bradley had the slide up and he had a dollar sign for satellite and then he had like four dollar signs for LIDAR, that's about right. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I'm glad that's accurate, too. I'm glad that it's like that's uh, it's like the star system in Yelp or something. It's like, all right, this is a uh, one quarter worse than, than this other restaurant. But thank you, Dave. Very relatable. Um Absolutely. Okay. So got a couple more. Um, it says, how quickly can satellites cover large areas? Aerial surveying has certain regulatory restrictions like daily flight time and range. Does satellites have any similar constraints? Uh, no, I mean, uh, you, I mean, in, in regards to regulations, we could take imagery of everywhere. Maybe not like Area 51 or something like that, but along every single infrastructure, you can absolutely do that. We wouldn't need to like, you know, contact a regulatory body or anything like that. Um, and also there isn't, you know, any you know, uh, restrictions on um, how much satellite data we could acquire in a certain amount of time. So uh, that speed of acquisition thing, I, I think that's maybe where the question was heading to. Um, it's, we, it's very quick to acquire all the data. Okay. Um, and then I've got um, just about one last question before we are, are going to wrap up. So if there's other questions that, that you do want to submit, I, I want to encourage y'all to go ahead and submit those questions. Um, you can submit them now, but I do encourage you to continue asking questions on demand. So in the event platform, you can continue to ask questions um, and we will have um, Bradley and, and Dave respond to those uh, as those questions come in. So feel free to engage on demand as well as um, today. Uh, we appreciate it. So um, question here, it says, can you combine weather data with satellite-based surveying to enhance the forecasting elements? 
Uh, yeah, you absolutely can. I mean, even when you, we think about our growth rate modeling too, it's not just dependent on like the historic archival data and that pixel to pixel differential. It actually takes into account like a lot of different variables too, like weather um, and, and all these different types of uh, moisture elements too. So we take a lot of those different types of indices and, and leverage that as well. Great. So it, it's, yeah, it, it makes it a lot more accurate too. And a lot of people have tried to use like weather combined with species data too, to be able to think about growth rate in regards to species, the, the, the density of those species along your power lines, and then extrapolate that and then apply those growth rate modelings. And it's really inaccurate too, because it doesn't take into account like all the little differences, like the same species in my yard would grow differently than my neighbor's yard. And there's like, you know, the competitive interactions, like are there dense shrubs around the base or the anthropogenic disposition? Like, is it by a roadway or, or like human structures that could potentially be shadowing the, that, that tree? So there's a lot of different micro variables which impact species growth rate. So we combine a lot of those different variables and then do that observed measurement uh, scan over scan year over year to be able to understand with a high degree of accuracy where those trees are going to be um, in the future. Okay, great. Um, okay, guys, well, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I do have a few notes for everybody. Um, coming up tomorrow, April 21st is a, that is not the 21st, the 29th, uh, is a webinar, Wildfire Mitigation and Innovating What's Next. Uh, so join us tomorrow on April 29th. And then I want to remind you of the series that was last month, as well as the series that are coming up. So last month, we had a Securing the Grid series. It is still available on demand through the end of the month. And so go ahead and check those series out. It's a really good one talking about physical and cybersecurity. Uh, we are continuing this week with our wildfire and risk mitigation. All of the series, all the sessions that we've had leading up to this, there's a couple webinars as well, or a couple uh, podcasts, as well as about nine different webinars. All of those are available on demand for you and will be available for 60 days. Uh, so take advantage of that, share this with your colleagues, invite them to be part of this virtual series. In June, we'll meet for a couple of days instead of dragging it and kind of spreading it out across the month. We will uh, meet for two days, the end of June to talk about distributed energy storage. So I have really two focused days talking about what's all happening in the storage and distributed energy distributed energy resource space. Uh, so look for that in June. And then in August, we're going to talk about the future grid, emerging T&D technologies. And so while wildfire is one of those, and there's a lot of emerging technologies happening around the wildfire space, there's a, also a lot of other great emerging technologies happening across the T&D industry. And so we encourage you to join us here, talk about some of those, be part of that conversation, uh, and engage and hear what's coming next for the utilities. And then we're really looking forward to meeting in person. I can't, can't leave today without saying we want to see y'all here in Texas. Uh, want y'all to see in the home state. We want to see your bright, shining faces in, in Texas in person. Uh, October 11th and 12th, we are going to have a, a, an event in person all about black sky hazards and grid res resilience. We know every utility across the world is really focused on grid resilience these days. Uh, they're, you know, looking at all blue sky as well as black sky hazards and how do we really understand what's happening and be better at what we do in delivering uh, and providing power. So uh, join us for that in person in Dallas, October 11th and 12th. We hope to see you there. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much today uh, to AI Dash, Bradley Smith, and Dave James for Avesta. We appreciate y'all being here today. Thanks for joining us. We'll see y'all next time. Thanks.